Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light that shines in the darkness that the darkness cannot overcome. As followers of Jesus, do we shine with the same radiance as our master, or have our lights been dimmed? In recent times, have we lost our credibility? Is it time for the church, the bride of Christ, to recover her luster and brilliance? Can we once again live as a people committed to Jesus, not only as the way to the Father, but as the way of the Father? Can we shine the light of Christ in such a way that it illuminates a dark and weary world? It is time for us to be radiant. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we are grateful that you've called us into this space. We know that, that we are here because you've called us here, that you've gathered us here by your Holy Spirit. We are grateful for the chance to, to raise our voices in worship together, that you inhabit our words even when we don't know how to give our, our, our groanings words. God, now as we turn to your word, would you open our ears and our hearts to receive what it is you have for us today? We pray too, God, would the, the words and meditations of our hearts and our mouths today be pleasing and acceptable to you. Amen. I want to tell you about the Los Angeles Angels. Surprise! I'm going to use a baseball analogy today. I want to tell you about the Los Angeles Angels. Uh, some of you might know this, some of you might not. The Los Angeles Angels have two of the best players in Major League Baseball, m maybe in a long, long time, on their team right now. Let me tell you about those two names. The first one is Mike Trout. Maybe you know Mike Trout. L let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a consistent all-star selection. He's a three-time MVP. He's consistently in the top 20 of every metric in baseball that anybody measures. He, he's maybe, thought by some, maybe one of the best all-around players to ever play the game. And then there's a guy named Shohei Otani. Maybe you know this name. This is the first pitcher slash hitter since Babe Ruth. A long time. This is a a lights out pitcher that also plays designated hitter on his off days so he, he he plays almost every day and he's really good in 2021 he won basically every award you could think of and this year he ranks third in triples fourth in home runs and fifth in stolen bases this dude is an amazing generational talent this might be literally a generational talent right in front of our eyes now you're probably wondering, why is this interesting at all? <laughs> Here's why it's interesting. For all the talent that these two players bring to the Los Angeles Angels, the Angels are terrible. Terrible. They are absolutely terrible. As of Friday, they were 20th in the league out of 30 teams based on their record, and they might be worse. They play in a really bad division. They might be worse than 20th. They are terrible. Now, this is one of the reasons I love baseball is these two future Hall of Famers, they are future Hall of Famers. They cannot alone carry this team. The team itself, the team around them, the other seven players on the field have to function together as a team. And if they don't, if they function like nine individual players that happen to be on a field together at the same time, they will always find themselves 20th or worst in the league. They have to be a team. Now, this week in our Radiant series, we're going to talk about what that means for the church, for us to be a team, not just a roster of individuals but a team, and what that might mean for our radiance. And what does it mean that we are a people, called to be a people, on mission together, and how does that make the church radiant? So before we get into that, if you have a Bible, I want to invite Hazel up. Hazel is going to come up and read scripture for us today. 
If you have a Bible, uh, well, actually, you know what? Maybe if you have a Bible, maybe leave it closed today. I, I, that's not blasphemy, I promise. We're going to read from Genesis and 1 Peter. So unless you're a really fast flipper, uh, the words are going to be on the screen, or you can just listen to Hazel today. So hear now the word of the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's two things that stand out in these texts as it pertains to the church being radiant. And I want to explore those together. The first is this, that God promises, God promises to make us a people. God will make us a people. Now let's real quick, let's pause here for a second. I want to address a couple of the words You'll see in both of these texts, we see the, the English word nation, and we also see in First Peter the word race. Now, I don't think it would surprise you to hear that there are parts of the church that take these texts and these words and use them out of context in ways that are harmful, ways that are not faithful. So I just want to say that the, the, the original language, the original context for these words, like nation, would not have meant what they mean today. The, the original context and language was not referring to a, a nation as a literal bordered country, right? A bordered country would have, been, would have been an alien concept to the writers of either the Old Testament or the New Testament. And even the word race doesn't mean what we think it does. When, when the writers refer to race, this doesn't mean a homogenous group of people. This doesn't mean one ethnic group. It means simply, when we read nation and race, we read simply that God promises to make us a unified people. See, these would not have been the spark or the trigger that these words are today. Simply, we are made into a, a, a group of people, a team, if you will, to use our base, baseball analogy. Now, we in Reformed theology, we have a word for this. We have a word for what happened in Genesis uh, with Abram and, and God, and that word is covenant. Maybe you've heard this word before, maybe you haven't. This is often used in, in, a, in a church setting, but covenant is another way to say essentially a promise or an agreement. Abraham enters into a covenant by making a promise to be faithful, to be faithful in doing what God asked, to, to leave his family, to leave his country, to leave his land, to follow God, and God enters into a covenant by promising to Abram to, to, to bless his family and to make his family into a great nation to be a blessing for the world. Now, what we can't miss in all this is that God is the agent. God is the one doing the work here. Verse 2 in this Genesis passage says that, that I will make you, God will make you a great nation. First Peter is the same. God has called us out of darkness into light. God is the agent. Abram simply followed. See, the same is true for us today. We, we are not the church. I, I'm going to use the word the church a lot. I, I'm not, just to set the tone, I'm not referring to like this physical space or, or us right now. When I say the church, I mean like the church global, like all of, all of, the, all, all of the disciples of Jesus together. Right, we, we aren't the church because, because we choose to gather here together. The church isn't the church because we simply decide we want to be in the same building together. The church is the church. The body of Christ is the body of Christ because God has chosen to make us so. Not because we've decided it's best for us, but because God has chosen to make it so. 
See, God is not only the agent, but then also the center around which all the church is built in the person of Jesus. See, there's no such thing then as a solo Christian. Maybe you've heard this before, that an individual Christian is kind of an oxymoron. Sometimes we say it like this, that, that our faith and our discipleship is both profoundly personal, but also never private. Right? There's no such thing as an individual Christian. To be a follower of Jesus is to be part of the church, is to be part of the body, to be the nation, to be the, the, the people that, that our text today invites us into is also an invite to a, a, a body. In her book, Radiant Church, that we're going through as a staff and leadership in a, in a class here, Tara Beth Leach calls this covenant togetherness. We're called into covenant togetherness. It makes me think a little bit of 1 Corinthians when, when Paul writes this. For just as one body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greek, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Covenant togetherness. Now, maybe you've been around Reformed theology or our denomination for a long time, and if you have, you'll know that covenant is one of the core tenets of what Reformed theology stands on, is, is covenant between God and, and God's people. And this covenant togetherness, this is not foreign language. I want to share for you, this is, um, I'm going to read something for you from our baptism liturgy. When, when we participate in the sacrament of baptism, we invite the body to make a promise, to enter into a covenant. I'm going to read that for you. This is, again, from the baptism liturgy. This is the question that the body answers. Do you promise to love, encourage, and support these brothers and sisters by teaching the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family in fellowship, prayer, and service? Isn't that beautiful? Like, this is really cool stuff. Like, we get to enter into a covenant with this every time we, we enter into the sacrament of baptism. We get to promise this as a people. It's really quite beautiful. It, it is covenant togetherness, but you'll notice there are some things missing, right? Th that though we are made one, there are some things missing. Number one, it's not conditional upon what building we sit in, right? There's nothing in this liturgy that says we make this promise as long as that person being baptized stays in this sanctuary. It's not conditional upon what building we sit in. Here's what else is not in that liturgy. There's, there's no, no part of this that leads us to believe that covenant means that we'll always agree on everything. Covenant doesn't mean that we'll never have conflict to resolve. But here's what it does mean. Here's what it does mean. It does mean that when we inevitably disagree, that we promise to disagree well. It does mean that we inevitably have conflict that we promise to seek wholeness and to seek reconciliation. It does mean that uh, this promise means that our core togetherness is found not in what we agree in, not in what we like, but it's found in who we are in Christ. As united in Christ by the Holy Spirit, this is the core of our togetherness, who we're being made to be. A people. Not a bunch of rogues, not a bunch of names on a roster. A people. Here's the second thing that stands out. Did you notice that neither of those texts, and uh, neither of those passages ended with, I'm going to make you a blessed people, period? Neither of those end there, Right? Both of these passages go on to say something else. Genesis 12, 2 says this, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, 
in order that you might proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you. You'll be great and you'll be blessed is not the end of the story. There's no period there. There's no punctuation ending that thought. The same thought, the writers go on to say that there's a reason, there's a a purpose, there is in fact a, a mission. God is going to bless and make his people great and, and bless them so that they might be a blessing in the world. This is the mission of the church. This is the sending. This is the, the why, if you will. Let's go back to the angels for a second. I want you to finish the sentence. You have, I want you to just blurt out the, the end of this sentence. The Los Angeles Angels assemble and are made into the best team of baseball players possible so that they... (laughs) I heard that, but that's probably not not the right one. (laughs) Anybody? Win the World Series. That's, That's exactly right. This is the Angels so that. They are assembled and made into a team so that they might win the World Series. I wonder, I wonder how we would answer the question. How, how would we as the church answer the question today? We are made into a people so that. I wonder how we would answer that today. Maybe, maybe what I wonder more, and maybe what might be more important, how would someone outside the church answer that? How would someone looking into the church right now answer the question, what is the church's so that? Well, I think if we're going to answer the question, I think it's right here. I think it's in these passages. Right? The idea of being a blessed people, that God makes us into a people and blesses us so that we might go and be a blessing. This is the same calling that Jesus says when he says the greatest commandment is actually to love of others. This, being blessed to be a blessing, is how we live this out. This is what it looks like. This is how we love God and love others. See, this idea of being made into a great nation, into a great people, being blessed, so that, so that we might go out, this this going out to be a blessing, this is not periphery. It's not secondary. This is, in fact, the primary call of the church and how we, in fact, love God and love others. As I, as I wrote this this week and studied, I actually began to wonder if maybe this, maybe, maybe this is a huge piece of what makes the church radiant and what makes the church distinctive and attractive. I, I actually found myself reflecting, I think this is what makes the church so attractive to me. It's the fact that the the call of us as a people is so different than how the rest of the world works. Right, right, think about it. If, if, If we were made into the church, the body of Christ, simply for our own prosperity or our own self satisfaction or our own self gratification or even our own comfort, if 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 that was the purpose, the church is not unlike any other organization in the world. The church is exactly the same as every other organization or group. Here's the truth. If, 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 I, if I was looking for a place to have social relationships and have some sort of comfort or prosperity, I can find that in a million different places outside of the church. That's not what makes the church attractive to me. Here's what does make the church attractive to, to, to me. is that God calls us to be blessed and to go out, to be light in darkness. Light in darkness. Think about that image. Calls us to be light in darkness. This is what I can get on board with. Being a part of the church that lives that, desires to live that, seeks to live that, and knows wholeheartedly that We're invited into this covenant togetherness by God, empowered by God, and never left by God. I think this is what makes the church so radiant. 
I'll be honest again, I, I'm not super interested in being part of a, a holy huddle, right? Or a, a social club. Again, there's a million different places we can find that. But I think what we can get on board with is being on mission that brings peace and rest and hope. This is what makes the church radiant. Friends, this is why Trinity is here. Both campuses, we believe deeply that this is our call. And I want you to hear me say this. This is, I think, why this campus is here at this time in this place. is to do just that. Go on mission to be a blessing to the world. And friends, it's already happening. Some of you know these stories, but I want to I share some stories with you. Trinity Church is already on both campuses participating in this. Uh, about a year ago, I got, a, I got a phone call from one of our ministry partners from Atlas. Some of you know ab- about Atlas. And this person said, hey, hey, we have this situation where we're working with one of your neighbors in Hospers. Um, not physical neighbor, neighbor meaning community member. We're working with one of your neighbors and there's kind of this really messy situation and this person said to me, and, and Trinity just feels like a church that's going to enter into that. Trinity just feels like a church that's going to enter into these places where maybe it doesn't feel like a nice, like comfortable church box to be in. And, and like that hit home for me, that this person knew that this is what we're about. And he was right. He was right. He was right on all accounts. There, there was sort of a messy situation. And this person needed some home repairs that they were having a hard time making happen for themselves. And guess what? people from both campuses together came together and went to this person and was a blessing to them. I I believe wholeheartedly that this effort allowed this person to take a step towards wholeness. That's one story. We had another one of our neighbors just a few weeks ago reach out via our, our website. Maybe you don't know this, but on our website there's a place where anybody can go and submit a, a prayer request, right? Um, and and it, comes to, it comes to one of the staff members. And, and this person that, that we, don't, we don't have a relationship, this is a Hospers community member, sent one of these requests and said, you know, it's been a hard go. We, we've had some things fall at a bad time and we're days away from our power being shut off. And you know what they asked for? Prayer. They didn't ask for anything. They asked for prayer. One of our local needs team members got a hold of this and said, well, I think we can do more than prayer. They made a a connection with them, and their lights are on. Their lights are on. Both campuses supply a number of our community members with boxes of food for people that just need a little hand up. A couple weeks ago during the ministry, kids ministry kickoff on Wednesday night, one of our, one of our community kids said to Melinda, this is so much fun, I love coming here on Wednesday nights. It's already happening. It's already happening. I I could go on and on, and I'm sure some of you could go on and on. And I wonder, I wonder if these are just the tip of the iceberg. These are tremendous stories. These are such great stories, but I wonder if there might be more that we're sent to as well. More ways of being a blessing in hospers. And maybe more importantly, I wonder if there's a way that we might be blessings in the places that we live, like our neighborhoods. Here's what's true about a church like Trinity. Not all of you live in hospers, right? But here's what is true about a church like Trinity. You you all have neighbors, either literally or metaphorically, you all have coworkers, and you all have, we, we all have people that we interact with on a regular basis. Let me give you an example. I have a, I have a pastor friend back east um, that lives this out really well. Now, this might surprise you, but we pastors, we don't get to spend a lot of time with people outside of the church. Right? Most of our time is spent with, with you all which is where it needs to be. But we don't often interact with a ton of people that are outside of the church or that wouldn't identify themselves as Christians. 
But this pastor friend of mine, he, he realized something about his routine. He realized that he did a lot of work out of a, a Starbucks near his, near, near his church. He, he would write sermons at Starbucks. He would, he would just go there and drink coffee and do his work. And he realized that he sees the same baristas almost every day. He sees the same ones every day. And, and he realized that this is the place that God has put him and these were the people that he was going to be a blessing to. These baristas who didn't know him, had no connection to his church, had no connection to him at all other than they make him his coffee, these were the people that he was going to be a blessing to. See, as we think about being sent, being on mission to be a blessing to the world, and even being a blessing to those in our neighborhoods, I'm reminded of this. That this, this is not often going to be a church initiative. This often isn't going to be a program. This isn't going to be something you volunteer for. Like my friend at Starbucks, it really is just about living in the present. Living where God has put you, noticing what God's doing around you. Noticing who God has put around you. I wonder about this. I wonder if blessing being a blessing as the, the people of God, I wonder if it might even look like some of these things. Maybe it looks like simply seeing the people around you. Maybe it's just calling people by name. Maybe the next time you're in, in a store or you're, you're at Fairway and checking out, maybe you just call the person by name. Maybe that's all. Maybe it's simply getting to know people. And when I say getting to know people, maybe it's like genuinely listening and genuinely caring about who they are and what their unique story is. Maybe, maybe the people that God has put around us, maybe they find themselves on the margin of either the church or of the community, and maybe it's speaking for them or standing up for them if they need to be stood up for. Maybe, maybe it's as easy as not participating in small town gossip or taking the opportunity to speak truth into those spaces. Now, I want to I say this to you. Being on mission like this, living into this call to go and be a blessing to the world, that this, this isn't just a, a way to invite people to church. This isn't actually about inviting them to church at all. In fact, if, if, if your experience is anything like my friend's experience at Starbucks, the chance to invite someone to your church may, may not ever present itself. And if it does, the people may never ever come. And, and that's okay. That's okay. Because that's not what this is about. Being God's people is really about loving the people well that God puts in our place in our spaces, in our circles. Hear this too. You are where you are on purpose. You are around who you are around on purpose. God has put us in these places on purpose to be a sent people on mission, a blessed people on mission to be a blessing in the world. Even that neighbor that drives you crazy. Even that neighbor that you just want to like bring his neck sometime. We, we all have those neighbors. Even your coworker or your cubicle mate that says the inappropriate jokes all the time. Even, even that person. We are around each other on purpose. And, and be encouraged. None of this is to shame you. This is to encourage you. Be encouraged that these opportunities to live this call to be a blessing to the world, that these opportunities are around us every single day. And the call is simply to live them out in little ways that are faithful to the covenant that we enter into with God. I want to share something with you. I, I've shared parts of this with you before, but I want to share it with you again. I was, I was at a pastor's retreat a, a, a number of months ago and one of the exercises that all of us pastors were invited into 
was to write what they called an I have a dream statement. And the purpose of this, it really was an exercise to get present to what God was doing in our congregations, in our communities, and in ourselves. What, what passions and stirrings was God putting in each of us as pastors for our, again, for our communities and for our congregations? And, and I, I wrote this, and I want to share it with you. Here's what, why, why I want to share it with you. Because I, I, I truly believe that this is what we're called here to do. I truly believe that what I'm about to read to you is a vision of a radiant church. It truly is a, a vision of a radiant people that is both distinctive and attractive to a world that only knows darkness. So let me read this for you. I, I have a dream that Trinity Hospers, as uniquely positioned in the community on purpose by God, would be used by God to meet needs that have been previously unmet, would welcome those who have been previously unwelcome, and would be instruments of flourishing in places and systems that currently seem void of flourishing. I have a dream that we'll do all of this in authentic community with each other, that we might allow ourselves to be drawn more deeply into the person of Jesus Christ, and that we might grow in our emotional maturity so that we might name what's so for us, define ourselves while maintaining genuine connection and unity even in our diversity. And that our community, our unity, and relationships are built not upon personal opinions, not built upon political party, or even our own comfort, but on our communion as the body of Christ, called to partner with God. I have a dream that this campus would meet tangible needs of our neighbors in a way that the community of Hospers has never seen before and in a way that would have been previously impossible. That we would use the resources of being one church in two locations, financial, staff, and intellectual resources, to stand in the gap in tangible ways for our neighbors and to ease burdens that feel so heavy, and that we may provide hope in the darkest of nights. I have a dream that the Hospers campus would be able and willing to operate in Hospers, yet outside of the Hospers systems that we'd earnestly desire to become a place of belonging, healing, and hope to those that find themselves on the outside of these systems that run deep, that we may truly be agents of shalom. I have a dream that we, Trinity Hospers, would go armed with the gospel and equipped with the Holy Spirit to be instruments of flourishing that would allow our community to live as their truest selves, that we would offer belonging in such a way that reflects the kingdom of God as modeled by Jesus Christ. That we would speak for those who can't speak, stand for those who can't stand, and seek reconciliation for each and every one of our brothers and sisters. That we would be wall breakers, not wall builders. I have a dream that we would be a body that believes that we can impact the conversations of our day that seems so heavy that we believe even in our day-to-day -day interactions with each other that seem mundane or ordinary, that we can truly have a kingdom impact on issues like reconciliation for the races, the way the LGBTQ community experiences the church, gender equality, and the gap that might be experienced by those currently on the outside of the church or on the margins in other ways, that we believe and hold deeply our commitment to bring a gospel perspective into these and many other conversations in front of us today. That we may speak into these boldly, truthfully, and with love and grace rather than running from them. I have a dream that Trinity Hospers would be an instrument of authentic transformation in lives of our neighbors in and around Hospers. That in the years to come, lives would be made new in ways that are only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit so that God might be made famous and receive glory. And that God may begin to grow this community's faith family tree from the roots that he's firmly establishing today through Trinity Hospers. Friends, I invite you into this with me. I invite you into radiance. I invite you into seeking shalom. May we be a people not a, a roster of individuals that happen to be on the same field at the same time, but a people 
empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit to go and be a blessing. Now, each week we've been giving you what we call a radiant practice to help you engage some of this content, and I want to do the same today. Th this practice I want to give you today is called the practice of examine, or the prayer of examine. Has anybody heard of this before? Th this is um, a, a practice that was first made, made sort, of, um, sort of implemented in the church in the 16th century, by early church fathers and mothers. And the prayer of examine is, is this. It, number one, its foundation is built on the, that we serve a God that loves us deeply, that doesn't love us conditionally based upon our actions, but loves us deeply because he calls us his own. Now, the prayer of examine is this. It's, it's a, a time set aside at the end of our day to reflect on the day, to reflect on the places where God showed up, to reflect on the places where we noticed God show up and to reflect on maybe the places where we didn't notice God showing up. It's a practice that invites us to, to, to wonder if we responded to God showing up. Did we notice God show up and, and did we lean in or did we pull back? Again, not out of shame. We believe that we don't learn or grow without the practice of reflection, and this is what this is. Again, knowing that God loves us whether we lean in or not. So I want to invite you into this. I, there's more about examine than I can say in this time and place. Um, on our website, on the, if you scroll down, there's a radiant button. Click it. It'll give you more information about examine. This is, this is a practice that, that, that I do. Uh, I, I did for a long time. I'm kind of excited to enter into this again this week, but it really is, it really is a great time to just sit and reflect and notice. Man, God shows up a lot. So please, enter into that with me this week. And again, may we be a people together. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for gathering us and uniting us into one people. For blessing us. For giving us your presence through the Holy Spirit. For extending us grace and mercy through your son Jesus. God, would we be a people that doesn't miss the so that in these texts. May we be a sent people on mission be a blessing in the places where you've already put us. Oh, open our eyes, God, to notice those places and notice those people, not as projects, but as image bearers, image bearers of your divine image, worthy of our love, worthy of being noticed. Would you make us into this people for for your sake, not for the sake of our greatness or Trinity's greatness, but for the greatness of you and your kingdom. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.